Hi everyone, I'm Matt. Um, today we're going to be doing another video um, in the Foundation series, and actually this is also going to be part of um, a new series I'm going to call the Confirmation series, where uh, I take a look at um, scriptural confirmation God gives for particular events um, in His Word and history, um, and also show some of the real-world confirmations um, that He's provided as well. In this case, we're going to look at a real-world um, interpretive aid that God provided um, that verifies um, the date of his crucifixion and also conveys a lot of information about why you know, certain markers appear as they do in history um, and in scripture. Um, you know, before, you know, as we get into this, um, you know, as with anything, you know, what we're, you know, learning potentially some new information, um, I would say, you know, try to keep an open heart, open mind, also let the Holy Spirit lead you. I would take um, what you receive here um, in prayer, you know, to the Lord um, and go into the Word and do some more research on your own. Um, so what, what I'm going to be pro proposing is a definitely a minority view on the dating of the cru crucifixion. Um, but really, at the end of the day, what matters is what God has um, verified um, both in His Word and through history um, and through the evidence that He has given us. Um, and th this date is going to defy um, a lot of people's expectations. Um, because it's not, one, you know, the typical dates that are proposed are 30 A.D. or 33 A.D. Some people propose 31. Um, what I'm going to be showing is that the actual um, crucifixion of Jesus Christ was, um, as it sh shows in this document here, was Wednesday, April 28th, um, 28 A.D., which is much sooner than a lot of people realize. Um, and this, this article um, is by um, uh, uh, Palin uh, Ramsender. Hopefully I pronounced his name correctly, and this is uh, this is when he was doing his, I think his um, PhD uh, document for the University of Cambridge. But um, anyway, he has sets a lot of different sources. Um, I will be linking this document um, uh, in you know in the description for the video. Uh, as just go going through it, I'm not going to do obviously a full analysis here because it's um, somewhat detailed. Uh, but uh, and really, I want to use this as a launch point simply to go into the rest of the evidence we see in Scripture that supports this date and specifically supports the year of 28 AD. Um, but um, what, what, what essentially he shows is, uh, you know, kind of goes through like, you know, the, the wave sheep offering, the Jewish holidays, Passover, um, the night to be much observed, and then. Um, you know, breaks it down pretty clearly in this chart here um, with scriptural references that, you know, pretty definitively lock in particular markers um, for the crucifixion. Um, and basically from that, we determined that there's basically just a few candidates, if you will, that would qualify. Um, some of them are in, in uh, you know, 31 AD and some are in 28 AD, but we're going to see that 28 AD is the actual fit. Um, and so he kind of narrows down the um, this is based on some of the astronomical data that was available for the Julian dates, um, the years of the potential candidates, if you will, um, kind of whitt whittles it down <laughs> even further to April 28th, 28 AD, and then also potentially April 25th, 30, um, 31 AD. Um, you know, eventually coming to the conclusion, though, um, that uh, Jesus Christ was crucified right down here on Wednesday, April 28th, 28 AD. Um, again, I'll, I'll link this document. I suggest going through it. Um, what what we're going to see though is that God, in a very powerful and bold way, directly confirms the state, like across a huge span of scripture. Um, and uh, it's actually pretty amazing the way He does it. And so we'll, we'll look at that. Um, we're not even like I said. We'll also be looking at the um, real world evidence for this as well. Um, one of the reasons I'm doing this video, um, obviously, it's important information. Um, I'm trying to get out the videos related to God's roadmap for his second coming. And in that, if you've watched some of my previous videos, um, you'll see that I'm identifying 2028 as the initial end date. And obviously, um, I've talked about some other videos how that's not actually the end for those who go through the tribulation. Um, that's kind of, there's two frames of reference. And so we can look at 28 AD as a initial um, end, if you will, but it's somewhat modified based on God's plan, this time altering plan that he has in place. Um, but it would make sense that it would the end would be 2028 if indeed Jesus Christ was crucified in 28 AD, as that is uh, 2,000 years later. Um, and we'll also look at the evidence 
because the year 30, 30 AD is also significant, which was 40 years before the destruction of Jerusalem. Um, that's actually prophesied in Ezekiel, and we'll look at that a little bit and show why there is that two-year gap between 28 AD and 30 AD in God's accounting. Um, but, uh, you know, one of the things I wanted to talk about, too, and this is, this is another chart that I'll... Um, um, if I'm able to link it, I will. I'm, I can't remember if I actually have the original link for this, so I may or may not be able to link this. But this is from biblicaltruths.com, so I'm sure you guys could still search for it. Uh, the pretty good resource, I don't agree with necessarily everything they propose, but in this particular place, I think they're pretty spot on with the analysis they're, they're providing here um, of Jesus Christ, you know, um, death and resurrection. And they, they don't identify the year in this chart, but they do identify that it would have been a Wednesday. Um, we can see that here that he would have been. Um, unfortunately, we've inherited this idea of Good Friday from the from the Roman Catholic Church, and that 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 tradition has just not unfortunately died um, because it's not biblical. It's not also historical. Um, what we actually see, um, and, and again, um, if you have a time chance to, you know, either find this chart or uh, pause the screen, you could kind of break it down and look at it yourselves. But basically, there's two two Sabbaths in view. There's a high day Sabbath that would have been over transitioning between Wednesday and Thursday. And there's another Sabbath, Sabbath, which is the week, uh, weekly Sabbath. And this confuses a lot of people. And it's one of the reasons why I think for a long time people got the date, the date wrong. Uh, but basically, Jesus Christ would have been you know, placed in the tomb right kind of on the threshold between day and night on Wednesday. Would be, have been a full three days, like you said, the sign of Jonah, exactly three days and three nights. And, and even in, see here in Matthew um, 1240 that Jesus Christ gives that as the sign of the, you know, the sign of Jonah was was the sign of his death and resurrection. So it, have to, it would have to be a full three days and three nights. You don't get that with Good Friday to Sunday. Um, but what what we see though is that he would have actually risen on evening of Saturday, not and then it wasn't until Sunday morning that he would have been that the tomb would have been discovered uh, empty. It's interesting. He actually gets a clue to this. I think it's made in the Gospel of Matthew. He says is you know that he's also Lord of the Sabbath. Um, and, and then, you know, the seventh day, the day of rest, the day of completion is fitting um, for a resurrection. And, you, and Sunday, which would be the eighth day, which represents a new beginning of the new week, would be appropriate as new birth or new life after that. Um, so even, even just in a typological aspect, it makes sense that this would actually be what, what we see for Jesus Christ, uh, uh, crucifixion and resurrection. Um, with that said, um, what I want to do is I'm going to go through a lot of the scriptural evidence first um, that supports this 28 AD date, and um, also points to, to the again to the end also be in 2028, which is 2,000 years later. Um, and then once I get through the scriptural evidence, I'll go to the real world interpretive aid that God provided that confirmed this. Actually, there's two. Now that I'm thinking about this, there's two real world aids that God provided. Um, that confirm one one confirms the date and the other one confirms the the age of Jesus Christ, um, and actually, that's something I'll I'll show just really quickly. Um, kind of this is just a really quick chart I, I whipped up, is that we would have seen there's a, a couple of interesting things we can map. We can map the actual number of calendar years that Jesus Christ was present. So any any year that whether he he was there the full year or not, any year that he was actually present, and that would actually be 33 years. But when you map the actual calendar year dates from you know, 5 BC to 28 AD, um, that's what we see here for this, this span. And then when we actually map the age of Jesus Christ, not, not the calendar year dates or the number of years he was present, we see that that is actually th that, um, 31. And so he would have um, you know, actually been 31, not, you know, it's coming tight, he's 33. And this gets to another point um, about one of the misunderstandings of one of the reasons we have this idea of a three and a half year ministry um, comes from really, I think, saying, uh, Augustine, who kind of unfortunately misinterpreted Daniel 9, 26 um, and 27 and saw, um, I think there's obviously motives potentially behind that as well, but anyway, broke up, saw that the halfway point of the 70th week was a reference to Jesus Christ's first coming. Um, and so they saw what, well, you know, half of seven is three and a half. And so that's where we get this idea of three and a half year, you know, three and a half years. That's unfortunately a, a, a misinterpretation of that passage and a misapplication. 
what we actually need to look at is the biblical precedence for the Lamb of God. And if we go to um, Exodus 12, um, actually, I'll just pull it up really quick. And, and, we, and we would consider, um, uh, you know, from the, the time that Jesus Christ is baptized and that he, his ministry begins, it really is, is the time that we, cons we would consider that the Lamb of God is identified. And obviously the Lamb of God at the time of the start of his ministry was identified by John the Baptist. Typologically, we would expect that to kind of be like a, a symbolic starting point. And here back in Exodus, when we see the qualifications for the Passover lamb, we see, it, we see that it says, your lamb shall be without blemish, which Jesus Christ was, and a male of the first year. You should take it out from the sheep or from the goats. Um, you should keep it up until the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And again, that goes back to that chart we just saw of the Lord being killed in the evening you know, right here. Um, but the, the point is that, you know, we, his ministry shouldn't have been, you know, if, uh, you know, there's two ways to interpret the first year, like it could be within a year or you have the first year and then beyond that uh, for, the, for, the, for the, the age one of a lamb. Um, this, I've, I kind of did some research, this, research on this. There's a little bit, bit of debate on whether the first year means within the first year or after the first year. Um, regardless, what we see is that what I think the precedence and what we're going to see God confirms that his ministry was just shy of two years. It was about um, you know, almost two years, but not quite. So he wasn't, so he was still in that first year range, you know, the qualifications of a, of a Passover lamb. And this is one of the traditions, unfortunately. And actually, if you, if you look through um, this, again, this, this uh, presentation talks about that. Um, what we see is that if you look at the Synoptic Gospels, they really only give an account. Um, they don't give a full account of three and a half years. The, you can only kind of piece together the idea of a potential three and a half year ministry from the Gospel of John, but the, but the problem with that is that the Gospel of John is not chronological entirely. And, um, you know, it references potentially dates that happened before his ministry or, you know, it kind of jumps around. And so you can't really um, definitively state that it's representing, you know, the, a full three and a half year ministry. Um, but that said, again, we're going to look at the evidence and see that just, you know, God kind of gives us a lot of clues through his word about the 2888. One of the first clues I'm going to look at is just the structural nature, which is that the word cross, you can see down here, is found 28 times in the Bible. And so already God has kind of given us a, 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 um, a clue here that, that there's a connection between 28, between, between 28 and the cross. Um, the next thing we'll look at is the word crucified it occurs 37 times. And remember, if you saw my uh, previous video on, on God's roadmap, which is admittedly a lengthy video, um, I began to introduce um, God's secret number of 37, which is represented as 37 and, and Amos 37. Um, this is a number God uses to refer to himself, his nature, but it's also a number that God uses as a prophetic address within the context of scripture. So this isn't necessarily an address for a date, but it's a kind of a address as a convergence point. Um, there's a, it refers both to the first coming, and it's but and it's very often used as an address for the second coming. And that was covered in the um, previous video I did on the though it tarry that message about that roadmap. Um, but anyway, we, we see that connection here to crucified. One of the um, Oh, yeah, the other thing I want to mention is that the 28th squared verse in the Bible, so 28 times 28, that verse number, which is 784, is Genesis 28, 10. It happens to, you can say it happens to land in Genesis 28 in verse 10, which is God's number for time. And so it's, it's hinting at 28 being the appointed time. And again, that's the 28th uh, squared verse of the Bible. Um, again, there's just a lot of these structural clues that God gives us. Um, speaking of um, structural clues, we're going to look at how Genesis 1-1 uh, points to 28 AD and 2028 AD in two different ways. It also points to, um, as you can see here, the appointed year and start of the end um, with the English word count, but, but putting that aside for now, we just want to focus on um, the, the Hebrew side of the, of the equation, if you will which had, basically there's seven Hebrew words and there's 28 letters. And so the, the, the 28 
letters that we see in Genesis 1-1 are prophesying the first 28, which is 28 AD, when, when Jesus Christ, the Aleph Tav, which is given here in this middle term, would come and be crucified. Um, and the other interesting um, thing about this is that it, it's comprised of seven words. Well, 28 actually is the triangle number of seven. So if you add one plus two plus three plus four plus five plus six plus seven, you get 28. So, that, so even inherently there's a, an intrinsic relationship between seven and 28, and seven is God's number of completion. So just even a, in a structural or mathematical sense, God was prophesying this, this perfect point, if you will, in his plan. Um, the other interesting uh, thing about that is that we can actually see that when once you know that 10 is God's generic number for time and the Yod, which is the 10th Hebrew letter, is connected to time, we can see that God gives a position count for the end. And again, this is God declaring the end from the beginning. Um, the last Yod is the 20th letter. So this, so this row here is shown the, the letter position and then this row here is shown the gematria value and also so that we can see here this this would be the yod and so again that the yod that the last yod and there's a, there's a couple so we have actually three yods here but the last yod is the 20th and if you go from the 20th to the last letter you get 28 so you get 20 28 when you when you go to the last marker for time and so god is in this way calling out the end 2028 20, from the beginning and again we and then also calling out the year 28 through the hebrew letter count and the last letter count being here for example um, so just something to take note of that you know, from the very beginning God has prophesied his crucifixion here and also um, the, the initial end, if you will, for the tribulation. Um, the other interesting thing, as I said, when we looked at that chart, was we could see that Jesus Christ was would have been 31 years old in 28 AD. The very last verse in Genesis is verse 31, and I think this is God signifying both the first Adam and the last Adam. And this is me kind of hypothesizing here, but I believe Adam was 31 years old when, when, when there was the fall. When, you know, that's how many years he lived, sin, you know, a sinless life essentially before the fall. And then you have the last Adam who would also live 31 sinless years, um, you know, but not fall, but you know, um, you know, perfectly offer himself as that, that sacrifice. Um, and so we, there's a connection there as well that you know, this last verse in the first book of the Bible being at 31, I think God is actually calling out um, the age of the, the first Adam who fell, but then also the age of the, the last Adam, Jesus Christ, you know, a quickening spirit um, who would be at that age at the time of the crucifixion. Um, okay, so then we're going to look at a couple other instances where God kind of gives some symbolic or typological, typological allusions to the year 28. Um, so here in Genesis 28, um, the, the chapter is very s symbolically actually connected to the Lord's coming and in a lot of ways and I'll just, I'm just going to um, in the interest of time I'm going to grab a couple highlights um, that I think are probably the most visible uh, so here in Genesis 28 12 um, it says and he dreamed and this is where this is the passage of Jacob's ladder essentially and he dreamed and beheld a ladder set up on the earth and the top of it reached to heaven and behold the angels of God ascending and descending on it and so we have this picture in Genesis 28 of a ladder between earth and heaven and that was you know an angels coming up and down and um, you know we, we know obviously that at Jesus Christ you know coming um, and then also you know definitely uh, in the year of his crucifixion it would have been you know a pivotal year in God's plan a, a, a bridge or a ladder, if you will, between heaven and earth. Um, the other uh, interesting thing here is there's some some kind of uh, historic commentary that God is providing in His Word here in the next in this verse in 28:16. Um, it says, "And Jacob awaked out of his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not." And so it's interesting when Jesus Christ came at His first coming and or you know and then was crucified in 28 A.D. Um, in love, you know, for us, that, you know, eventually Jacob will wake out of its sleep. Israel will wake out of their sleep eventually and realize um, that the Lord, you know, came to them. But it's kind of this commentary that at that time, Israel did not know that they had been visited by the Lord. Um, so much of, you know, there's definitely a, a remnant of 
Messianic Jews that came to the Lord, but you know, on, on the whole, or you know, for the most part, Israel rejected Jesus Christ, and so they, so they knew not that Jesus Christ had visited them. Um, and then we go a little bit further, and this is very interesting because it's the last verse in chapter 28 of Genesis, and as we've, we've discussed in previous videos, the, the number 22 often can be associated with the Tav, the 22nd Hebrew letter, and in ancient Hebrew script that was two crossed wooden sticks. It was literally a wooden cross. And so God is connecting the year to the cross in this verse and has this symbolic picture for us. And this stone, which I have set for a pillar, and think of the stone of Jesus Christ, shall be God's house, and of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. What's interesting is if we go to, so this is twenty eight twenty two. if we go to Proverbs twenty two twenty eight, the inverse of that, it says, remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have set. And you know, it's, it's basically a direct reference. You can see going from 28 to 22, 22 and, the, and the 22, which is the cross, is the bridge between the two. So if you, if you, mad, if you imagine bookending these two verses together, you've got you know, the 22 is between them. Um, but I think this is also because um, one thing that is mentioned in this article is that um, when it comes to like church fathers, there's there's a lot there's a lot of disagreement, but it's a, but there were some that you know would have recognized the earlier date, um, but that unfortunately was uh, that ancient landmark that understanding was removed, um, and so um, you know God would directly um, spoke against that, uh, and, it, and it's making a connection here to that that pillar that the stone which he set for a pillar. Uh, definitely a landmark and a pivotal landmark here in God's plan connected to the cross. Um, the next thing I want to show, again, we talked, we saw how crucified, is, there's 37 instances, and the, the number 37 is intrinsically tied to God in his nature, um, but it's also, um, again, tied to some of the prophetic, ad, to, a, to this prophetic address God uses in major points of, of his plan, specifically the first and second coming. Um, in this case, we're looking at Genesis 37:22, again, a reference to the cross. And, uh, and this, this, I'll show where I'm going with this, but we see this typological picture of Joseph being thrown into the pit, which is kind of like Jesus. You know, he, Joseph is a type of the suffering servant, a type of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And Reuben said unto him, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that, um, that is in the wilderness, and lay no pan, hand upon him, that he may rid them out of their hands to deliver to his father again. So that the pit here is symbolic of Jesus Christ being in the tomb. Um, and again, it's connected to the cross here. Um, you know, but it's thrown, shown through the typology of Joseph. When we go to verse 28, we get another reference to the pit. But this time, Jesus Christ has been pulled out. And, and you know, represented by Joseph, obviously. Um, then there passed by Midianites merchantmen, and they drew and lifted up Joseph, Joseph out of the pit. And Joseph sold, you know, and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. silver. And remember, Jesus Christ was sold for 30 pieces of silver. Um, and there is a connection between, between the 20 and the 30. Um, and again, I'll talk more about why the year 30 AD and 2030 AD are also important. Um, there's a couple bookends that are being referenced here. Um, basically, this, this being lifted up out of the pit is a reference to when you know, Jesus Christ would have been lifted up out of the pit after the crucifixion you know, on, you know, on Resurrection Day. Um, again, the, another, I'm just going to briefly touch on Exodus 28 and leave it for you guys to do your own study on if you want. But one thing that's interesting, it's, it's talking about Aaron the high priest and, and the ephod and him burying essentially the, the nations on him, which are represented by the, the gems in the ephod. And that's essentially what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross, is he you know, bore the weight of the nations, the weight of our, you know, of our sin upon, our, upon himself. Um, and he did that in 28 AD. And so that kind of an interesting reference there. So I'm just mentioning that now. You guys can do your own study on the ephod and this particular chapter if you want to. Um, and again, another reference here in Exodus is um, 34, 28. Um, and this is, and it says, he, and he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He did ne neither eat bread nor drink water. And he wrote upon the tables of the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. So here, God's given us a, a, a year reference. And 40 days and 40 nights, if we look at God's millennial calendar, would be the, from the cross in 28 AD, going 40 jubilee years forward would be 2,000 years. That's the 40 days and 40 nights that Jesus would be separated. And, and what did he say after he said, I will never, not drink again until I drink it in the, you know, the kingdom of, 
you know, with us. And so that's, again, um, symbolically represented here with, with Moses not drink, eating or drinking um, for 40 days and 40 nights. It's that this is symbolic of a church age and that, that period of departure that would happen beyond this point. Um, Deuteronomy 28 is just another, uh, like Exodus 28, I'm not going to do a, an analysis here. I'm just going to mention that it's a study because it's basically, um, it's mostly this is maybe not as, as explicitly of a reference um, other than the fact that it's showing the contrast between blessings and cursings and the result of Israel um, turning from God and um, you know denying him, not recognizing him, and so uh, not hearkening to his voice. Um, and so um, it's just kind of the thematic of the rejection that actually happened in, you know, in 28 AD. Um, so again, I'll just, and it's a really long chapter, but I suggest uh, doing a study on that if you guys are interested. Um, okay, we already covered that. Um, as we go forward, one, one we're going to look at some more conceptual um, mappings that the Lord provides. I'm going to talk about First Samuel, which is um, one of the most um, deeply symbolic and typological books in Scripture. It has tons and tons of different layered typologies and um, things going on. Um, it's the ninth book in the Scripture. Um, and some of the previous videos, we talked about how the number nine is God's number for fruit. And, um, we, you know, from... Um, I think it's First Corinthians 15 to 20, I think, talking about Jesus Christ being the first fruits, and so really this is symbolic of Jesus Christ being the first fruits, um, represented through, the, through a couple different types. Actually, one is Samuel as a prophet, and then we also see David as a king, because this is the first book that David is introduced, which is um, uh, basically here in First uh, Samuel 16. Um, but what's interesting is we can see that the very first chapter of Samuel has 28 verses. Again, just another structural clue for us. Uh, another structural clue, again, is that there are 31 chapters, which, again, points to, um, you know, the age of age of Christ, the, the, the last Adam, as we saw, reference in Genesis 31. Um, we get to the first fruits, um, you know, living to that age. But what's interesting is if we go to chapter 28, we, we, so we, God has given us a clue to what to, uh, and through this typology, what, what is going to happen to uh, the first fruits, if you will, represented through, through the type of Samuel in this particular case um, in 28 AD. Again, signified by this, this chapter 28. Um, and it's essentially, you guys are probably familiar with this story. It's when Saul was realized he had disobeyed God. He was disobedient that the kingdom was being taken from him. And he decided to go to, um, you know, a seer or a witch, essentially, and um, somebody who's had associated with familiar spirits and try to see if he, if she could raise up um, Samuel from the dead to commune with Samuel to get advice on, or basically to get counsel. Um, and so what's interesting is, um, and I'll just, I'll just read a couple parts really quick, I guess. Then said the woman, Whom shall I bring up unto thee? And he said, Bring, up, bring me up Samuel. And when the woman saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice. And the woman spake to Saul, saying, Why hast thou deceived me? For thou art Saul. Um, and the king said unto her, be, be not afraid, for what sawest thou? And the woman said uh, unto Saul, I saw gods ascending out of the earth. Um, and he said unto her, What form of it? And she said, An old man cometh up, and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul per perceived that it was Samuel, and he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed himself. And Samuel said to Saul, Why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? And Saul, Saul answered, I am sore distressed, for the Philistines make war against me, and God has departed from me, and answereth me no more, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Um, therefore, just a sec. Um, <clears throat> I have come, called thee, that um, thou mayest make uh, known unto me what I shall do. Then said Samuel, um, Wherefore then dost thou ask me, seeing the Lord has departed from thee, and has become mine enemy? Um, and the Lord hath done, done to him as he spake by me. For the Lord hath rent the kingdom out of thine hand, and give it, give it to thy neighbor, even to David. And so I'll end it here because this is a critical you know, verse in verse 17, which is also kind of symbolic of the resurrection and God's victory. But basically what we see you know, is you know, 
we, we can debate about whether this is truly Saul or not, or whether it was a familiar spirit, um, you know, speaking, in, you know, in, in the place of, um, you know, if this is if this is a vision that God in this one instance allowed it to occur, um, you know, I don't want to get into this one into the weeds of, of exactly what was being revealed here, but the point is that just in the context of this prophetic typology, we see a picture of being raised from the dead. This is a picture of resurrection, um, at least symbolically, um, being raised up from the earth. And it, you know, it, and it uses the term like, you know, little g earlier, but it says, you know, I saw God ascending out of the earth. And we know that God, the true God, Jesus Christ, ascended out of the earth um, in 28 AD. And that's when the king was rent from the leaders of Israel, which is represented by Saul in this typology. Basically, you know, because they had been disobedient to God, um, the kingdom was rent or taken from them and given to David, or the, the son of David, Jesus Christ. And that was with his victory on 117. Um, and so because thou obeyest not the voice of the Lord, or, uh, and then, and so really that's kind of the sum of what happened, you know, when Jesus Christ um, came. Um, you know, I'll just go through a couple other references in the first verse in Psalms 28. We um, see another reference to the pit that we saw earlier, referenced in uh, Genesis 37. Unto thee will I cry, O Lord, my rock, be not silent to me, lest if thou be silent to me, I become like them that go down to the, into the pit. And so that's, again, another subtle illusion that God is providing about, you know, connection between 28 and the pit, or Jesus Christ being in the tomb at the time of the, uh, of the crucifixion. Um, here we find another reference in Psalm 119, which is about God's word. And Jesus Christ, obviously, is the you know, word made flesh. And this is in the passage about the Dalit, which is the fourth Hebrew letter, um, which we see here. And, you know, obviously it was on uh, day four of Jesus, of uh, God's plan, at the end of day four, that Jesus Christ was crucified. Um, and that's related to, so the Dalit, um, as number four, points to both the door the cross and the day in which you know the Lord would come and be crucified but it says my soul melteth for heaviness strengthen thou me according unto thy word on um, this reference to his to a you know David's soul melting goes back to you know another psalm by David which is Psalms 22 again reference to the cross and 14 being reference to the Passover on the 14th and it says I am poured out like water all my bones are out of joint my heart is like wax it is melted in the midst of my bones so you have another reference to melting here in psalm 20 psalms 22 that you know is related to this you know his soul being melt, melted here for heaviness um, again connecting it to 28. okay um oh yeah so another thing i just want to mention is that um in one of my videos <laughs> sorry I'll, and I'll probably i'll try to link a lot of these i, I talk about how the number 20 um, is uh, one of God's numbers for second kings. And it's one of the not numbers that's associated with, with um, those who are in God's kingdom, those who are born again. Uh, the number 10 is associated with the kings. Just, um, and 10 is one of those numbers that has multiple applications. It's God's generic number for time. It's um, ordinal perfection. It, 10 represents the law, because there's the Ten Commandments. And 10 also represents kings. Um, one of the examples of that are the, the 10 toes, if you will, and the vision um, of Nebuchadnezzar's dream that we see in Daniel. Um, there's actually a lot of references or association between 10 and kings. Um, and you'll notice too that the we have 10 digits and uh, on our hands and 20 total. But, and, and this is just shows how God even can base truth just through biology, that the first 10, the, the ones that are in the earth that are dirty essentially, will, that, which are like the 10 toes in the this, in this statue and, and, um, and King Nebuchadnezzar's dream, um, are you know the, the first kings the, 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 but second kings, those are that are above so our, our hands, which are the second set of 10 that are above are those you know hands that are clean you know, that, that can do the work of God um, when he's in us and, and so you have this idea of, it's also a reference to his second birth, to being born again and so 20 is God's number for second kings. And it's usually a reference to uh, Jesus Christ and the church. And Proverbs is the 20th book in scripture following Psalms, which is the 19th book. Um, what's interesting is that the last chapter and verses, again, 
uh, are, is 3131. And again, that points to the first atom and the last atom encapsulated um, in, the, in this book about the Second Kings. Um, but it's, you know, it's also in the context of wisdom, which you know, was given to um, Solomon. And Solomon, the Prince of Peace, was, was a, another, one, another type or foreshadow of Christ. And so there's a little bit of an interesting play there as well. Um, the other thing I want to mention is if we go to Ecclesiastes 3, there's this, this pretty well-known passage. It says, to everything thing there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. And then starting in verse 2, it goes through all the different categories of time in this passage. And it's basically, this passage is verse 2 through 8, which concatenated would be 28. And, the, and there are actually 28 categories of time. So you can go through and count these if you want. But there's 28 different categories of time, and the last time category of time is a time of peace. And in one sense, God brought us, you know, peace to the soul in, in 28 A.D., and will bring peace again, um, you know, at, at the end. In, in um, uh, I was going to show it, do, 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 you know, in, in 2028. Um, so again, just structurally, in, in Ecclesiastes 3, 2 through 8. Um, God is calling out 28 once through the verses, and he's calling out 28 in the context of the text, which is that the, the 28th category of time is also a time of peace. Um, and actually, if you go to Psalm 37, 37, you can see a connection here. And so again, you get God's secret number 37. Mark the perfect man, Jesus Christ was the perfect man, and behold the upright, for the end of that man is peace. And, and he's talking about the end at the, in this particular case. And as we saw in Ecclesiastes, it was the end or the last category of time mentioned. Um, the other thing I want to mention is Isaiah 28, which again, here's another. And, and Isaiah 28 actually thematically captures both 28s. It captures the first 28, um, you know, Jesus Christ coming and, and his crucifixion and resurrection it also captures the judgment that will conclude at the end of the second 28 which is 2028 um, but we and it kind of talks about the failure of, of Israel and uh, Ephraim the, the tribe and I you know and, and God a lot of times will use Eph, again the tribe of Ephraim which is um, fell into idolatry to contrast it with the type of Ephraim which was um, you know the Gentile second born of Joseph which represents the church and so um, God will often ju create a juxtaposition or a contrast between the <laughs> wickedness of the tribe of Ephraim, but still use Ephraim to, rep to hide or conceal the church uh, in the Old Testament. But um, with that said, um, the verse I really want to go to was um, verse 16, because this is where we see a definitive connection to Jesus Christ. This is, therefore, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation a tried stone, and if you saw my video on God's picture stories, we you showed this connection and, and how significant this was. A precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. And so now here we're finding that 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 tried stone was tried in 28 A.D. Um, and again, if you continue um, into this passage, um, it talks about you know the judgment that will come at the you know the, at the second 28, and it kind of leads up to it. it. Says, for the Lord shall rise up. As in Mount Perizim, he shall be wroth as in the valley of Gibeon, that he may do his work, his strange work, and bring to pass his act, his strange act, and the strange act in this case is uh, judgment on the world. <laughs> it says, Now, there, therefore be ye not mockers, lest your bands be made strong. For I have heard from the Lord, God of hosts, a consumption, even determined upon the whole earth. So this is definitely talking about the, you know, the, the tribulation period and then at the latter end that will lead up to the second 2028. Um, Okay, so we're kind of coming into uh, just a little bit more scriptural evidence, and I'll look at the real world evidence because um, uh, I, I think that'll be pretty exciting just to see uh, just how awesome and faithful God is um, in teaching us. Um, so what, really, what I really want to talk about now is the book of Hosea, um, and this is a significant book because it's the 28th book in the Bible. So if Jesus Christ crucifixion truly was in 28 AD, as we we'll see it is. Um, we, we should expect something significant, um, you know, about the structure of this book. Um, and actually, you know, we, we see God pleading throughout Hosea for his people to turn to him. And, in, and then in Hosea 5, we see 
um, this. We see in the last verse, I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense. And so really, it's, it's a single offense. It's really when we're thinking about prophetically that's in view, their offense was crucifying and denying the Lord in 28 AD. And again, the Hosea is the 28th book. And seek my face. In their affliction, they will seek me early. And then we, then we see, come and let us return to the Lord, for he hath torn, and he will heal us. He hath smitten, and he will bind us up. After two days um, will he revive us. And the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. And so if we go back to the um, millennial calendar, we can see that you know after the crucifixion, there's two days, which is 2,000 years, before they're raised up on the third day. Um, and so that's really what that, that is prophesying there in Hosea, is that you know after two days he will revive us, and the third day he will raise us up. Um, and so what I want to show though is that there's a, again, Hosea is the book 28, which points to the, you know, crucifixion date, 28 AD. There's 14 chapters and that points to Passover because Jesus Christ was crucified on the 14th day of Abib or Nisan, which is you know, the first month on the Hebrew calendar. And there's 196 verses and there's, and the 196 is one of God's really unique numbers that he uses. Um, uh, for himself, and particularly in this case for um, his crucifixion. Um, 196 is 14 squared, which is 14 times 14. Again, that's Passover, and so it's kind of a completion of the Passover, the true Passover lamb. And so we have the, the shadows of the old Passovers in the Old Testament, and this is the ultimate Passover, the full completion of the Passover lamb, which is why it's squared. So whenever you see God's square number, another good example is the number 25. Um, Five is God's number for grace, and 25 is five squared, which is five times five. And so 25, God, God often uses to represent the fullness or completion of grace. In this case, this is the fullness or completion of the Passover, which is Jesus Christ, the Passover lamb. The other interesting thing is we can see that 196 is seven times 28, which is the um, number of words and letters that we see in the Hebrew alphabet. And we previously talked about the intrinsic numeric properties and relationship between those two numbers. 196 is also four. We talked about, um, you know, Jesus Christ coming on day four, um, and also its connection to the cross times seven squared. You know, um, seven times seven. And so God's number of fullness, completion, or perfection squared, kind of the fullness thereof on, on day four. The other interesting thing about 196 is that it is the um, seventh triangle, seven number, and so. Um, Basically, if you if you take, take normally with a triangle number, let's say like the triangle number of seven, for example, is twenty-eight. So if you take one plus two plus three plus four, etc., up to seven, you get twenty-eight. In this case, what you're doing is you're taking a triangle of number of seven, but you're not starting with one. You're just doing it all with sevens. And so if you take seven plus seven plus seven, so basically you can see that there's seven rows: one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then you get to seven on the bottom: one, two, three, four five, six, seven. And so, and all these, all these sevens, this, this triangle of sevens adds up to 196. Um, it's a very unique relationship. And many of you guys know that again, seven is God's number of uh, completion and fullness. So, so God definitely structurally in Hosea called out the significance of um, 28 AD and its connection to Passover. And then, you know, just through the intrinsic numeric values that we find in, in the verse count, we see what he's conveying there as well. Um, I'm going to wait on that before I go there. Okay. Um, but now what I want to show is that God not only you know, gives us the, 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 the references to the year in many cases throughout Scripture, but he also gives us the actual full Gregorian calendar date um, for, for April 8th, 28 AD. Um, and so actually, I'm just going to go back to the, go back here. We can see that was based on the research um, that uh, Paul and Premis under did here. Um, and also just, you know, this research we can do ourselves, obviously, um, that, you know, kind of comes to the conclusion that um, that Jesus Christ was crucified. We can see down here on April 28th, 28 AD. And so that would be 4, 28, 28 or 28 for, you know, um, 20th day of the fourth month, 
in 28 AD. And, that's, and typically, like for example, um, you'll see God encode a lot of his dates that way with, with the days first, then the month, then the year. And that's what we're going to actually see in, in the Gospels and Acts. So, um, first of all, that like I said in one of my previous videos, God is actually identifying the, the end, 28, 20, uh, 2028, in the very final verse. Again, this is the, the final verse of Matthew, this is verse 20, in the final chapter, which is 28. But if you reverse this, according to God's reverse countdown, you get 2028, 20, which is the end. Um, and, and Jesus gives us a clue, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Um, however, if we just consider the chapter count, this is the 20, it has 28 chapters, and there's only two books in the Bible that have 28 chapters. One is the book of Matthew, the other is the book of Acts, and Acts 28, again, as we might expect, ends in verse 31, another reference to Jesus Christ's age. Um, but what's incredible about this is that from Matthew to Acts are four books. Because you have to go, you have to go Mark, um, Luke, John, and Acts. It's four. And so you have 28, you have four to get to Acts, then you have 28 again. So you have 28, 4, 28. And so through the, from Matthew to Acts, the only two books in the Bible that have 28, God is, in, is doing, has 28, 4, 28. Um, and actually, I'll show that really quickly on, um, I kind of represent that on, the, on this chart. And again, I've linked this chart in some other videos. But over here, I show, it basically, yeah, if you go, um, this is talking about the first coming of Jesus Christ, the five books in the New Testament, um, which is, in God, again, five is God's number for grace, map this way. So you have Matthew 28, you have 28 chapters, you go four books, you have 28, so that you get 28, 4, 28, which is the, the date of Jesus Christ um, crucifixion. We also get a reference to that being connected to resurrection because there are 117 chapters um, uh, between, or from Matthew to the end of Acts, and, and 117 is resurrection day. Um, the other interesting thing, and I'll talk about this a little bit, is that the 28th prime number is 107, and 107 also conceals Resurrection Day because it's as as a concatenation of 10 plus 7, you get 17, which is victory. But what's interesting too is God even calls out in Acts 25, which is the 114th chapter, which would map to Passover, because remember 117 is Resurrection Day. So in the 114th chapter, there's a reference to after the three days he ascended, and so it's kind of foreshadowing that three days later. And we go three chapters later, and we get to 117. Um, and so, just structurally, God has given us a, a tremendous number of clues in His Word um, with mathematical precision about the, the date of His crucifixion. Um, and, again, and again, so and it ends with 31, Jesus Christ's age. So He has the the end year and the age represented in the Book of Acts here. Um, so now that you know. I'm gonna take a little bit of a breather here because um, I think it's a good point to pause. Um, now the, the big question comes into play. Okay, so Jesus Christ was, was crucified in 28 AD. Why, why was the um, temple destroyed in, in 70 AD, which was 42 years later? Why, you know, because what we see later in Ezekiel and I'll, is it there's a prophecy of 40 years says 40 days I've appointed the a day for each year so a day for each year would be 40 years um, for and I'll, I'll jump forward to this in a little bit but basically this, there's 40 years determined for the offense of denying um, the Lord for, for judgment to come and that would put it at 68 AD instead of 70 AD if, if Jesus Christ's crucifixion was 28 AD um, but one one thing that I had, as the Lord brought me into his word, I started to really study um, this and, and uh, you know, the relationship between Jesus Christ as the head of the church and, the, and us being the body of the church, is that there, there's this tight relationship that, that um, you know, God is above all, but he doesn't separate his body um, from himself in, 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 a, in a very intimate sense. Um, and th this brings to mind Stephen, one of the first martyrs. Um, and what I long suspect is because <laughs> so many scholars got 
the crucifixion date wrong for Jesus Christ, I suspected that they also got the the year of Stephen's martyr martyrdom wrong as well. Um, I thought I and I there's actually I tried to find these articles, but in the short time I had, I wasn't able to dig them up again. There, there are some articles where people think that Stephen was martyred at a much earlier time than people realized, and I suspected that um, Stephen was martyred in 38 30 A.D., just two years after the crucifixion, and uh, you know, for for a while, this is kind of just a hypothesis I had, and you know, there was and it wasn't just. Uh, a shot in the dark. There was a lot of indirect scriptural evidence that hinted at this, um, but you know, one of the things I, I suspected is that you know, you know, perhaps even though Jesus Christ, the head of the church, was crucified in 28 AD, that God was giving the Jews or Israel a period to still receive His disciples to receive the message of the kingdom from His body, and and once they killed Stephen, that was them not just rejecting the head, but also rejecting the body. Um, and so what I want to go to now is the is Acts 7, which talks about Stephen, the, the first recorded martyr of the church. And it, and it says here in Acts 7, 56, um, and, I, and this is God encoding something for us. So 7, I think God is looking forward to day 7 on his calendar. Oops, wrong calendar. <laughs> you know, when he will be, you know, you know the resurrection and the millennial reign. But 56 is one of God's special numbers he uses to encode the year 2028, because 56 is 2 times 28, so it's the second 28. Um, and they said, Behold, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. And so this is looking forward to that point when Jesus Christ will be in all glory. Um, and it's kind of being foreshadowed, pointing toward, towards that second 28. Um, but yeah, what I want to point out, though, is that you know, when, you know, Saul, you know, who becomes Paul, was consenting unto the, unto the death. And actually, I think it's worth going to that verse. I'm starting to see this connection here. Um, okay, that's right here, actually. So after, and uh, cast him out of the city and stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. And so we see, and we see this here. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Um, and he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. But what we, what we see is that, you know, Paul was consenting to his death. And there's this, this, this relationship between Paul, you know, a symbol of the other church witnessing the first martyr's death. Um, and then we see this later. Um, in Acts 9, they were on the road to Damascus, and, and it's talking about Saul, who would become Paul. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And this is Jesus Christ talking, to, you know, talking to Paul, and you know, and but he's saying you're persecuting me, and Paul wasn't directly persecuting Jesus Christ, who had ascended into heaven. He was persecuting his body, the church. But Jesus takes that as a persecution of himself. And this is one of the clues early on that taught me, that led me to believe that Jesus Christ was going to give the Jews um, and even the, the, the leaders of Israel at that time, even after the crucifixion, time to repent and turn to him if they would, all, if they would even though they didn't receive him, the head of the church, if they re would receive his body and receive the gospel and receive the message of the kingdom, they still had that window to repent. But basically, they, when they martyred and stoned Stephen, they kind of sealed their fate at that point. And I had believed that this, that this occurred in 30 AD. And this is one of the verses that, that led me to believe that. Um, we see in Acts 28, 30. And again, that's, I think this is the span of years between the head and the body. We see this. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house, and received all that came in unto him. And so I think what God did is, you know, Paul, who witnessed the um, martyr Stephen, was kind of past the baton, if you will, to recoup the lot, the years that Stephen had in the early church and have those years appended to the end of the church. Um, and that's also, I think, that plays partly into God's time altering his plan as well, that even though 28 is the initial end, that for those who go through the tribulation, it's actually 
kind of bookend with a bookended with the years 30 to 31, or 2030 to 2031. And so there's this there's two frames of reference that are at play. Um, and again, 30 um, AD is significant because of this prophecy. Um, so the Lord is telling Ezekiel here to basically lay on his side, which represents the walls of Jerusalem being sieged. Um, it says, when thou hast accomplished them, lie again on thy right side, and, shalt, and thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah. So now this is talking about Jerusalem, the, the Jews, uh, specifically the southern kingdom of Judah, which denied the Lord. It says, 40 days. I have appointed thee a day for each year. So it's talking about 40 years um, you know, before their walls would be sieged, which is what would happen in 70 AD. Um, and this it's not a coincidence that this is in 4-6, because that's a minor if we see this as 46, that number is connected to the consummation of God's plan in time, which is also connected to the temple. Um, and so there's a couple different applications for it, but we see 46, for example, is referenced here um, for, the, for the building of the temple. And this is John 2.20. It says, Then said the Jews, 46 years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? And again, so if we go to God's calendar, you know, up in three days is when we have the fullness of God's, the consummation of God's plan in time, which is where that number 46 comes from and I talk about um, the origins of 46 and how it's used in scripture um, in one of my previous videos. Um, okay, now we're on beyond that. Okay, so anyway, we'll come back to that. So what, what I want to go to now is actually I'm going to come back to, yeah, I'll come back to this to the end, uh, at the end. Um, what I want to go to now actually is, is the real world um, evidence God provided for um, this, con uh, this crucifixion day. And uh, the way he did it was something that only the Lord would do, and it's for his glory. Because um, this was, and that was an answer to my prayer, I had been praying for quite a while on this matter of the relationship between the crucifixion and Stephen, and asking the Lord, 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 I think you're showing us that. You died in, you know, everything in your word shows that you died in 28 AD, but obviously 30 AD was still important, and, and you know, I see in Acts 28, 30, this potential that there was two years between 28 AD and 30 AD where, you know, Stephen had his ministry, then he was, then he was martyred in 30 AD. Is there any connection to that? Lord, can you confirm this, you know, if, if this is true, can you confirm it, you know, if I'm, or if I'm misunderstanding, can you kind of correct me and, <laughs> you know, show me the truth about this? Um, so this is something that had been kind of an ongoing prayer I, I had with the Lord. Um, back in September of 2023, um, I was working, doing a kind of a door-to-door -door, um, job, and I um, was out traveling a lot for this job. Um, I was on my lunch break, or kind of late afternoon break, but I had this, this um, meeting to meet a client at 315. Um, I was in kind of South Spokane, so Spokane, Washington, that area. and. Because um, even though I live in North Idaho, Spokane, so just on the other side of the border, I work over in that area a lot. And I wanted to, on my break, I wanted to go on this on this drive, um, just down out of the country. I just wanted to get out of the city for a while. I just wanted to, um, I tend to think a lot better when I'm out driving in the country or walking in the country. And, but I knew I had a limited time frame, so I thought, okay, if I could find something 10 or 11 minutes away from here, from where I was at, I was at this gas station, you know, I'll, I'll do the drive and then I'll go to my meeting afterward. Um, and, and I, you know, I, so I was just trying to, I wanted to go along the Palouse Highway, which is known as a scenic highway. And I thought, well, I'll just find the first thing I can find on my phone, and I'll click on it, that I feel like it's in that time range. And if it's in that time range, then I'll, then I'll do it. And so I, the only thing I could find along the Palouse Highway that I could click on on my phone was this little um, private business called the Lovely Nail Loft, and it was like a nail salon. And so I just clicked on it and mapped to it. And as it happened to be, it was exactly 11 minutes, which is exactly the time frame I was kind of looking for that I could basically, basically squeeze a drive into. And so I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll go do this little drive before before I meet the client or the, or, and the, the other person I had to meet. Um, as, as I started to drive though, I, had, I started to have this doubt that like, well, maybe this isn't the best use of my, my time. Maybe I can do something more productive with my break than just go on, on a drive. And literally, right as that thought came into my mind, this this um, Mini Cooper that you see in front of us, that, um, that you see in this picture here, pulled right in front of me. And uh, immediately on the, on the license plate, I saw, and I, I and then we came to a stop right afterward, which is 
very convenient. And you know, I think it was the office of the Lord arranging it so I could take this picture. Because um, I, I knew it was insignificant. So I, I took the picture. Because on the, on the license plate, you can see this. It's kind of blurry, but it says one cross plus three nails equals forgiven. And again, this is just my a quick phone capture through my windshield with a lot of sun glare and stuff. So it's not, um, and I blurred out the license plate for obviously privacy reasons. But I took this picture because I knew that was the Lord basically at that point nudging me to keep on going to the, to, to the lovely nail loft, that nail salon that I had mapped to. Um, as I got there, here, I'm going to go to Google Earth now. So I'm going to pull out here. Um, so I was up, uh, up here in uh, um, South Spokane, I think it was that. There's, like, there's like a, a gas station up here somewhere. I think it's right here. Yeah, so I was here um, at, at this Maverick uh, Adventures for Stop. <laughs> and, you know, I, I just wanted to go on this drive down this country road down here. And the lovely nail loft is this basically a private business. And this, you know, they have their home, but then they have their private business to the side um, right over here. Um, but it's just this private little driveway. So what happened when I was mapping to it, is I actually overshot their driveway, I, and, I, and as soon as I overshot it, I'm like, oh, you know, I'm like, oh, I missed it, and so I went to the very next exit, which was um, right here, and as we can see, it's Stevens Creek, <laughs> and obviously God, God meant for me to overshoot the lovely nail loft because as soon as I saw this, 117, it's a 170.00, but basically the number 117 popped out, which again, as we've talked about many times is Resurrection Day and it's referenced to Stevens and there's also 73 connected to the Palouse Highway and 73 we talked about is related to God's secret number 37 it's the inverse of that so the numbers 37 and 73 God uses um, throughout scripture um, kind of in a profound way um, so I knew that wasn't uh, an accident the other thing that was interesting is that the address this is the address for again the lovely nail loft um, you can see that that street which is just beyond up here is that it was at the address of 6811 and when um, I'll go back here um, when I had mapped this originally again like I said it um, I it was at 239 um, when I the first day that I, that I had this mapped and like I said, it was 11, it was 11 minutes there. And I remember that because of 11 plus 39 is 250. And that was, gave me another 10, like 15 minutes to get back to my meeting. Um, and so uh, it was exactly what, what a, you know, the time frame I was looking for. I noticed though that down here, you can see that it was the, that at this time, it, it's 11 minutes and 6.8 miles or 11, 6, 8. And that is actually, so that this 11 minutes, 6, 8 is actually what you see in reverse here for you know, 6 to 8, 11. And so you could actually see it as, um, uh, you know, 6.8 and 11 here. And so that God was definitely drawing my attention to that. Um, you know, I'm not sure, you know, and, and 1168 is 73 times 16. Again, another reference to 73. I think there's some additional significance because God obviously wanted to, to draw a connection to this. I mean, only God could arrange this that I had to, because I, I had to get this precise point for it to be exactly 11 minutes and 6.8 miles to the address <laughs> that, that matched this. Um, and uh, it was, what's pretty incredible is I once, I remember, I remember this, but I, I didn't actually take this snapshot on my phone the, the first day, because obviously I didn't know God was gonna show me something at that point. Um, it wasn't until that, until that Cooper pulled out in front of me with that license plate on that I realized that God was about to show me something. Um, but I wanted to, get a snapshot of this because I, re I remembered this when the first day this happened. And I came back day after day and I could never get the same, it was always like, you know, nine or 10 minutes or like 15 minutes. Like, and I realized that it's only in this very, 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 very narrow window between like 2.30 and three that it'll take exactly 11 minutes to get to this destination from this location because of traffic conditions, because of um, schools and school buses and stuff and so forth. Um, and so, I had to be, not only was this precise measurement 
of 11 and 6.8 match to the address here. But I had to be there at a precise point, a very narrow window in the, period, in the time of the day for this to map out this way. Um, again, I just just credit and glory to God for his, for his sovereignty with this. But what, what he essentially showed, though, if we go back here, um, is a convergence point. If I map out, this is, God is creating a, a symbolic picture here. So we have the lovely nail loft, and then we have 117 um, and 73, which comes after that. And if we're going in this direction, and now I want to show you if we zoom out. If I zoom out and keep on going, that this road heads to Highway 27, which is God's number for the church. So this is leading towards the church. Um, but so if we're coming to this way towards the church, though, or towards, high, towards 27, you come to the cross, the crucifixion first, which is the lovely nail loft. And the God, God, God's using in wordplay here because um, Jesus Christ was crucified on the, on the, you know, the lovely nails of Calvary. You know, and that, that going back to that whole, um, again, I love the way that God, might, God got my attention with this. is like one cross plus three nails equals forgiveness. So because I had mapped to the lovely nail loft, that's what, why this caught my attention because it immediately, immediately made me think of the lovely nails that um, obviously weren't lovely in terms of the, the pain they inflicted on the Lord, but what they did for us, you know, the Lord shedding his blood for us and giving us a way of salvation. And so these, these are the lovely nails that gave us eternal life. And so, um, because he had used that to lead me there, I, you know, I knew I was already sensitive to the connection he was making. Um, and it, it actually, I think I confused, I actually knocked on the door of these people and I talked to them, I think I confused them because I asked if there was, if they knew the Lord and if, if there was anything special about their house or property, because it, I didn't actually really piece this together until um, afterward. But um, what I, you know, as I sort of, because I knew God was showing me something, but I, that, but in parts of it were clear, in parts of it weren't. And so it took me a, a few days for it to kind of come together and see what he was really showing. But basically, I have, if you went towards 27, the church, you have the crucifixion, which is represented by the lovely Nilaw first, and you have resurrection day afterward, which is shortly after, represented by 117. Um, and then it's on Stevens Road. And so actually, if I zoom in here, um, if I go to Street View, I think. Yeah, you can see it's Stevens Creek, and it's on 117. Um, and so God is tying Stephen um, symbolically to 117 to Resurrection Day. Um, and if you follow this road um, up, it ends up here at um, Stevens Creek Trailhead. Let's see. Yeah, Stevens Creek Trailhead up here, and. The creek itself actually starts right about here, and so it's. And if I go go to this this uh, the properties of this, we go to the measurements. We can see that it's 2.16 miles, so it's just a little over two miles. And um, if you've seen some of my previous videos, I've shown that God will often use distance measurements um, to represent years. And so I knew that the, the, these two miles was a reference to the two years from the cross. And what this showed. And the creek follows, and the creek goes down this way. So you go two miles from the crucifixion, and then the, the, essentially, this is symbolic of the, 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 the creek of Stephen, the, the blood of Stephen flowing back to the cross. And that, and that you know, the, the, this is adding two years to that point. And so God, so God is symbolically kind of tying that connection in. In fact, this is below the rocks of Sharon, and there's another scriptural connection to the rocks of Sharon here. There's these cool rock formations up on the hill here that are above this convergence point, which is where the uh, Stevens Creek begins. Um, if Maybe if I do, if this is actually, I think, it doesn't make sense now, but this, I believe this is actually connected to Isaiah 17.1 and the destruction of Damascus. Um, and I know as I say that, it doesn't sound like it would be connected in any way whatsoever, uh, but there's some interesting connections that are, have to do with this site and the way and what God is connecting the scripture that's tying Stephen uh, and Paul, I should say, um, to uh, Isaiah 17.1, but that aside, the, the main thing that the Lord was showing is that you know, there's two miles that are added, or two years that are added to 117 to um, along Stevens Creek, that, and that creek flows back to the cross, flows back to the lovely nail loft, because the creek, you can kind of see it here a little bit, it's not a very big creek, but it flows through here, and then kind of under the street here, I think, and it, yeah, it comes out here, and so you can see um, that it's, it goes past 
goes back past the cross to the to the to the to the, to the loving else, and so that's tying the the head, Jesus Christ, and the body represented by Stephen together. Um, as you kind of look into this, one thing I want to show, and this is this is just a snippet from one of the infographics um, that, I, that I'll link, um, is it shows that you know. Not only is there this connection between 117, but God had provided some mathematical information to, to verify it even further for us. Um, so I already knew that 73 was one of God's special numbers. I obviously knew 117 was Resurrection Day, but what I had never considered is seeing what the product of them were. And I think God is symbolically like this, symbolizing that with the street sign right here. And so if you multiply 117 times 73, you get 8541. And if you divide that, and remember this is Resurrection Day, which is th after the cross, if you divide that by three, the number of days from the cross, you get 2847. And, and that, and immediately I knew that this represented because it's two this concatenated pairs of the crucifixion date, 28 AD, and 47, which God often connects to the crucifixion um, through Ezekiel 47, which represents days four and seven. Um, I've covered in this previous video about the millennial calendar, where if you go to Ezekiel 47, the 4,000 cubit measurements represent the um, 4,000 years before God's, you know, poured himself out on the cross and the rivers of grace, and obviously his blood also flowed at that time. And that's what these 4,000 um, cubit measurements represent in Ezekiel. And of course, they, in verse 5, which is God's number for grace, um, we even see that God, again, you know, structurally hints at this. In, in the Bible, there's 31,102 verses, which is this sum. If you add 7774 plus these three other, you know, numbers, you get 31,102. And if you, if you just extract the ends past the groups of sevens, you get 4 plus 5 plus 6 plus 7. That's 22. That points to the cross. Um, it also points to the appointed year, which comes at the dawn of day 7. Um, if you saw my previous video, we talked about the point of year, and if you notice in the past how you know the Lord is tarrying, just like He said He would. You know, in Matthew twenty-five five, He said, "While well, the bridegroom tarried." Um, currently, the Lord is tarrying, and there's a reason for that. My previous video on though it tarry um, explains that. Um, but essentially, that's what God was calling out here. But what's interesting is we can see um, the coordinates for the sign are latitude. So not only is this. Not only did God confirm it with, with the intersection of the sign number and draw attention to 28 and 47, and but the latitude of the sign, um, and I can go to the Google Earth here real quick. Um, go to properties. Um, you can see it's 47 degrees here, and with, you, know, you know, 32 after that, and then we have 117, 18. Um, and so we can see the, the latitude and longitude of that sign. Well, if we go back kind of look at this, again, the latitude, once again, it points to, to kind of in the vertical, points to the heavenly aspect of God's plan, which is encapsulated in Ezekiel, the 26th book in the Bible, and 26 is the number of God, um, one of the numbers of God. Um, and then, you know, 32 is 8 times 4, or new beginning, again, at day 4. Um, the 117 degrees, the longitude, um, I'm sorry, that's the, that's the left. The longitude, I'm sorry, um, points to 117. And that's, again, another way to point to Resurrection Day. And so God verifies it twice. He has 117 at the sign here. He also, this is at 117 degrees um, in the longitude. And also it's, and then it's, and here's where he ties the body. Um, we can see that it's, you know, point 18 after that. And so in the 18, ties to the body of the church. And if, and if you aren't aware of that connection, I recommend watching my previous video on the type of Ephraim. Um, in that video, I show how Ephraim is a type of the church in the Old Testament. Ephraim means double fruit. God's number for fruit is nine, so double nine is 18. Um, and so 18 is God's number that he uses for the body of the church. And so through the latitude and longitude of this sign, God is definitively calling out the resurrection and he's co connecting it to what we see in Ezekiel, and he's co connecting it numerically by this product to the year 28 AD, and he's connecting it to the church, which again is symbolized by Stephen, the first martyr. Um, and so he's tying all these things together for us.
Okay, let's see if I go. To cover that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> last thing I want to mention, guys, if you go to the north end of Highway 27, which is where this is leading, the exit for Highway 27, again, 27 is God's number for the church, is 289, which is 17 squared, 17 times 17. And again, that's God's complete victory, if you will. Um, so just, again, like, as we consider all this, we just see God's sovereign hand in his creation. Um, uh, oh, actually, really quick, because it's just really cool. Uh, the, day, the day after that happened, um, God showed me South Rebecca Street, which is right here. Um, yeah, you can see it's South Rebecca Street right here. It's about a half mile long, but it's divided, and it has two circles. Um, if you go to Genesis 24, um, uh, 22, so 24, 22, it talks about the jewelry of Rebecca. Uh, she has an earring of, of, like, of a half a gold weight, and she has two bracelets of 10. 10 is God's generic number of time, and 10 represents a circle or an orbit around the, the sun as well. Um, and so God represented that with these two circles, and, I, and I'll explain maybe in a future video why he wanted to confirm this, um, because Rebe because the jewelry of Rebecca in Genesis 24, 22 is connected to Matthew 24, 22, where Jesus talks about the shortening of the tribulation. He, it's basically the jewelry are abstractions God provided that map out how, how that time is compressed. And, and uh, I had prayed and asked God to show me if the, if the bracelets were circles or if they were, you know, straight linear accounts of time. And by directing me to the street, he was showing me that, yes, they're circles. <laughs> like, and so, um, anyway, there's just another world world confirmation that God provided. And, and um, you know, as I, you know, as I said in my previous video, I'm hoping to share more of these real world or interpretive aids that God has provided to help verify his plan. Again, everything ties back to scripture, but God uses these things he's created in the world to, like, like training wheels, if you will, to help get us to the point where we could see some of these connections a little bit uh, more clearly. Or even, I think, in the interest of time, I think probably all this stuff is in God's word. But I think this is a way of, that God can help expedite things for someone like myself and speed things up. Because um, as a relatively new believer, um, you know, I don't have a deep history of scriptural knowledge. Um, and so uh, I think God's being very generous and helping speed up some of my the things I'm asking about in his word by providing these real world aids to help kind of expedite some of that understanding. But yeah, I just thought this, this is a really cool confirmation to share that God represented his crucifixion with a nail salon called the Lovely Nail Loft. He marks Resurrection Day beyond that and then he shows two miles along Stevens Creek Road to represent the, the blood of Stephen, if you will, flowing back to the cross. Um, and so that goes back to um, what we saw in Acts 28.30 that the uh, crucifixion year for the head and then two years and then whole a whole two years and remember it was a little over it's like 2.16 miles for the, the the length of that of that road along the creek um, which is definitely which is definitely you know two whole years um, you get to the, the year of um, the martyr of Stephen and at that point is when the prophecy mentioned in Ezekiel of 40 years would kick off um, anyway I wanted to as, you know, in this video, talking about the end, talking about the second 28, um, which again is 2028. 20, um, there's just a few interesting references. We see this in Romans 9:28. Um, again, a shorthand reference. This says, "For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth." And this just relates back to what we covered in the video on the with Terry, how God has this time compression plan that He's going to shorten or compress the tribulation, just as He talks about in Matthew 24:22. Um, I'm actually I'm really quick. Just so you guys can see the what I was talking about with the shortening of the tribulation because it's, it's becoming relevant now, I guess. So yeah, in Matthew 24, 22, Jesus says, And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. And this is the first, Matthew is the first book in the, in the New Testament. If we go to the first book in the Old Testament, in the same exact demarcation of 24, 22, God gives us the abstractions for how he's going to shorten the tribulation. And I show those um, in this chart here, show how the, how the 
the, the rings, the jewelry, map to God's plan. Um, and I'll probably cover that more in a future video. But for now, I just want to show that, you know, it, it, it's talking about Rebecca here. And it says, and it came past the camels had done drinking that the man took a golden earring of half a shekel weight. So we see a half referenced here. And two bracelets for her of ten shekel weights. And so this is where I, this is where I had prayed and asked God. And it was, I think it was literally like three days before. <laughs> like that, that, that he before he showed this that I prayed and asked about this specifically um, yeah I basically asked okay are these bracelets symbolic of like a linear duration are they circles of um, you know the, the earth around the sun um, because 10 can represent just time in general or could specifically represent an orbit like, like a year and so that was really what I was asking the Lord and that's when a few days later he led me to South Rebecca Street and showed that it's about a half mile long, which is the earring, and showed that it's two circles at the end, or these, which is represented by these two cul-de-sacs at the end. In fact, actually, the dates um, of, or the addresses of the houses, um, I'll show you here. I think we'll show it on the web version, but actually mapped to the years 2022 and 2023. Like God actually uses the addresses of the houses to even map to his uh, reset plan. Okay. Um, that. that okay, okay so, so if you go, go yeah so what I want to talk about going back to Romans 9 28 though is that he said he, said, he mentions in the cut cut it short in righteousness so he's going to shorten the tribulation which we also saw in Matthew 24 22 um, but what we didn't realize is that God was going to shorten it on the front end that he was going to go into tarry and squeeze the tribulation into um, which we see here. So instead of, you know, starting from 2021 and going like this, he shortened it not on the back end like we might think, but he actually shortened it on the front end and pushed things forward and squeezed. So he's still going to get those seven years needs, but he's going to squeeze them into this period of time. Um, okay. Um, another, this is one of my favorite references is John 12, 28. It says, Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. And so saying, I have glorified it in the first 28, 28 AD, and will glorify it again in the second 28, you know, at the end, which is the, the end of the matter that Daniel 7, 28 is talking about. Um, anyway. Um, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished that the scripture might be filled saying that thy first thy thirst and so all things being accomplished being connected to 28 um, and again for Acts 4 28 for to do whatsoever thy hand on thy counsel determined before to be done and so it's shown that again 28 was determined from before from the very beginning of time um, and again Acts 28 28 talking about obtaining freedom in the connection with the cross um, and you know the verse 28 and then oh, I know I'll skip that for now one of the um, final things I wanted to, to uh, discuss or show that's kind of interesting is if we look at the, the phrase second time in, in King James Pure Bible Search we can see that there's 30 occurrences and 28 verses and again so we see we have both the 28 and 30 which we see in Acts 28 30 referenced um, through the occurrence count and the verse count and again this maps to what we'd expect for the second time you know also mapping to 28 and 2030 on um, this you know since we're here I'll just mention this that in, in Daniel 7 28 says hitherto is the end of the matter as for me Daniel my connotation is much troubled me and the, uh, and my countenance changed in me but I kept the matter in my heart First of all, it's interesting. This is verse. This is verse two two four, which is kind of encoding the year twenty twenty four, which is the beginning of the matter of, of, of judgment. But then uh, it's in twenty eight, which bookends the end. And heart is the thirtieth word. And and when we look at God's way, He's going to compress things. Twenty thirty is going to be if we if we kind of drop twenty eight the original 2028 mapping down on top of this, we can see that 2030 is in the heart of 2028. Um, and so it's just interesting. Again, um, there's, this actually is going to be like a transition period into 2031. You can see that 2031 starts in this period as well. So the end 
Um, and there's, there's some hints of some other time event that's also booking it at the end. So the, the actual end for those in the tribulation is probably gonna be um, you know, in, in that window of 2030 to 2031, even though the initial end um, from the, as we look at this top timeline is 2028. But yeah, what I wanted to show though is that yeah, that the word second time, God's kind of <laughs> structurally encoded that for us. The other interesting thing to note is that we can see that the last mention of second time um, is in uh, Hebrews 9, 28. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And again, that was in the first 28. Unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time at the second 28 without sin unto salvation. So that's the, and that's the last mention of second time in scripture. The first mention of second time is that other bookend, which is the initial point in time of 2022, signified for us with, um, you know, chapter 22 here. And if you go for the, these two bookends, 2215 to 928, 15 plus 9 is 24, which encodes the year that 2022 will actually speak in. And so, um, regarding the 2022 reset, and again, if that's no, if you guys haven't watched my previous video on, on though it tarry and God's plan to essentially tarry and then reset back to the initial point in time, I recommend that because that's not going to make sense at this point. Um, kind of actually <laughs> regretting someone even talking about because I, I don't want to you know throw this off too much, but um, I, I do want to show how the, the first 28 is connected to the um, second 28. Okay. Uh, oh yeah, the other thing I wanted to look up is the. Um, ladder end. So if you look at the phrase the ladder end, you see something interesting. Again, we see here 2022 encoded in reverse um, and, and, you know, two, two, Peter 2.20, 2, so 22.2 2 here, encoding 2022 in reverse. Um, we also see that, and then we also see 2024 in reverse, which again is, you know, going back to, you know, this, the, the year here. Um, in Numbers 24, 22. Uh, what's really interesting though, is if we go to Deuteronomy 32, 29, um, it's this long prophecy about Israel in the last days, um, where basically Moses is gonna tell them that they're in this, you know, what, what's gonna happen to them essentially. And it says, oh, that they were wise, that they understood this, that they would consider their latter end. Well, this, Deuteronomy 32, 29 is verse 5788. Hopefully you guys can um, see that here, 5788. 5788 is 2028 on the Hebrew calendar. So again, through biblical structure, through this verse 5788, God is again declaring the end from the beginning um, in his word showing what the latter end is, that the latter end, um, and I should mention too, that's, there's two latter ends, the latter end for the church at, which is bookended here by 2022, um, which will speak in 2024, and the latter end for Israel, which obviously is different, which is 2028. Um, but again, I'm just showing that God has encoded that um, uh, through this this you know entrance of the latter end in Deuteronomy. Um, no, I'll, I think I have to talk about the how, yeah. Maybe I'll cover this a little more in another video, Isaiah 41, 22, because there's another interesting connection there with the latter end. Um, but with that said, I think I've covered everything that I was hoping to cover. Oh, um, I'll just mention this. Yeah, this is another case where we can see that God, um, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll end on this, um, and then we'll call it good. So this is the 25th mention of high, capital high, as in the most high, the most high God. Um, and we see that this is in Daniel 7:18. Again, as I mentioned earlier, 25 is God's number for the fullness of grace. It's, you know, 25 squared, five times five. Um, so we should expect something significant here. Um, it says, but the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. So again, we see a reference to 18, the body of the church. And if we go back to um, here, we can see that the longitude here was 117 and 18. And so again, Resurrection Day, God connecting the body of the church to Stephen and in the creek. But here God's just connecting it to the saints, you know, the, the body of the church. Um, and so we have seven represents completion, and it's also an allusion to day seven on God's millennial calendar, you know, when, when that this completion will come in, 
come into fruition. Um, Daniel 7 is chapter 857, which is 148 prime, and 148 is, is the word um, ordinal sum in Hebrew, Greek, and English. So if you take the ordinal value of, in Hebrew, Greek, and English for word, you get, you get 148. And so the most high in Daniel 7 is really revealing the word made flesh, Jesus Christ. He is the most high. Um, what's interesting is that this verse is um, verse number 21,952 in the Bible. That number is 28 cubed, 28 times 28 times 28. Again, you have shown, shown how important this number is to him. And that the cubed power, which is raised in 28 three times, is even symbolically referenced in the text itself with three evers, ever, ever, ever. And so God is symbolically representing that here. Um, and again, and this is going to just show how precise God is, the word high in Daniel 7.18 is word number 575,232 in, in the King James Bible. Um, I'll, I'll link a, a link to my previous video on the Book of the Lord and also the, a document related to the Book of the Lord in that document and in, in that video I talk about how the King James Bible is the Book of the Lord that is prophesied in Isaiah 34.16. Um, once you realize that, you realize that every single word count, every single letter count is perfect. Um, if you don't recognize that, then you're not, you're not going to see some of these deeper connections that God has put in his word. And this is one example. You might think that this word, that this English word that happens to be high as the 575,000th, 232nd word is just some arbitrary count in the English translation. But what this shows is that God is divinely, has divinely inspired his book even in, even in the English, um, because this word is the 28th prime number, which is 107 times 3 times 7, which is God's secret, you know, the secret that's mentioned in Amos 3, 7, times 2 to the 8th power, which is another way to represent 28 visually. Um, so we have the, the first 28th, the 28th prime, Jesus Christ's crucifixion. We have, you know, and it's related to, again, God's secret number, the convergence of both the first and the second coming connected to the second 28. And the second 28, here's what's really cool about 2 to the 8th power, is that 2 to the 8th power, okay, I'll just show it really quick. Um, well, actually, I don't want to bring up the calculator, I guess, but I'll do it really quick, I guess. Um, yeah, 2 to the 8th power is 256. And as we saw earlier, 56 is one of God's kind of secret numbers for the second 28 because it's 2 times 28. But when you see, if you break out this to, as 2 times 28, you really get 2, 2, 2, 8. So you get the two bookends of the appointed year back in 2022 and, the, and 28 represented by the number 256. And that is all concealed in 2 to the 8th power. And so in a way that only God, <laughs> this just shows that God's, that God's work, God's uh, use of mathematics is beyond what, what we would be able to contrive on our own um, because he's calling out his first, the first 28th prime, the resurrection, um, the crucifixion and the resurrection as first coming, 28 AD. His, his number that relates to himself, 37, you know, 3 times 7. Um, again, that's also the prophetic address number he uses for his first and second coming. Um, and he relates it to the second 28, which is in 2028. And again, uh, 2 to the 8th power is, 250, is 256, 56 is 2 times 56, or 2 times 28. And so God is, and that, that number encapsulates the bookends of the appointed year and the end of 2028. So God has basically encapsulated kind of all the major bookends of his plan, his redemptive plan, in this single verse. Um, and that, you know, that just shows the awesome precision and power of God and just, um, just but he is now unsealing as well. And so um, one thing I'm hoping that, that this will just be for God's glory. Um, you know, with all these videos, I pray that you guys would uh, link and share them, subscribe, you know, share them with others, just so that this type of information can get out there to other believers and see, you know, to, to the church. Um, you know, that, uh, you know, just the dedication of the church, that God would be able to do this, what he wants to do with it. Um, and really, I just hope that, you know, my heart is that this would bring glory to God, to honor him, to show that he's generously unsealing and revealing things that have been sealed for some time um, and even re restoring some of the, of the lost landmarks um, that we um, 
you know, saw earlier mentioned, you know, um, how remove not the ancient landmark, which thy fathers have said. And, and talking about that, the stone, the pillar, you know, the stone of Jesus Christ, what he did in 28 AD. And so now I, you know, we're finally getting some of this re revealed to us and um, confirmed for us as well. Um, and, you know, in a, in a very um, spectacular way with just the way he's, he's kind of presented these things. But uh, anyway, with that said, um, I know I'll keep rambling if I look at all the, the um, other evidence because I'm, I'm covering a lot, but there is mountains of evidence behind the, the date of 28 um, AD, uh, April 28th, 28 AD, that I'm not covering. I'm, I'm actually trying to keep this as, even though it doesn't seem like it, I'm trying to keep this as concise as possible, um, especially since time is limited. But anyway, I thought, I hope this is a blessing. Um, you know, this, I hope this honors the Lord. Um, and uh, hopefully I'll be able to get some other videos out soon. It just depends on my circumstances and um, what I have, my resources available. I'm um, kind, of a, kind of in a difficult situation right now, so um, I'm not sure how soon I'll be able to get more of these out, um, but I will um, be getting some of these more out soon. Uh, anyway, with that said, I um, hope you guys have a blessed day. And uh, you know, all praise, honor, and glory belongs to our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.